Well, hello and welcome to this week one of the Tabernacle of God from Genesis to Revelation. I'm just going to let you know up front that this morning we had a wonderful in-class participation and engagement. Due to some technical difficulties, uh, we're going to be uh, filming it once again uh, here in this empty classroom. But needless to say, uh, the information is very important to our understanding of Scripture, and I hope that it still resonates with you all the same. And so with that, let me just go over what we're talking about. And over the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at uh, a couple of different items. Really, the deliverables include a foundational understanding of what biblical theology is. We'll start with that today. The actual tabernacle and temple. What can we know about them? What do they demonstrate to us? Why are they still important to us today, particularly as we look through Scripture? We're going to be looking at the continuity of the tabernacle. Again, not only in the Old Testament, but as it follows to the New Testament and why that's important. And then finally, the most important thing we can do in any equipping class is look at the personal application. And my hope is that after we spend some time together in these three weeks, that it, we're actually uh, changed, we're transformed in how we approach worship, how we understand the holiness of God, how we understand His desire to be with us. And that's really the emphasis of what we're going to be looking at. And so this week, week one, let's just set a foundational understanding on biblical theology. And what is biblical theology? And so we start with that with really the understanding of what is theology. If you're asked what theology is, what's your definition? Very clearly, if you look at the word itself, theo, meaning God, and ology, or logos, for which we get ology, uh, meaning word, but really more often than not, study. And so, very simply, the study of God. And I would say to a, a more broad understanding, theology is more than the study of God. Theology is the understanding of God. You know, someone once said that the very first thing that you think of when you hear the name God is probably one of the most critical thoughts you can have, uh, that it dictates and determines all of your faith. And so the same thing can be said here. Our understanding of God is critical because if I ask you, and I did this morning, I asked, uh, who, who is the theologian you know? by this definition, one that studies God or has an understanding of God that is most personal to you? Who do you know well uh, that is considered a theologian? And there were a number of uh, names that were brought up. Pastor Beatty, uh, of course, uh, Billy Graham, you know, uh, Charles Spurgeon, uh, someone maybe that you, that you know in your family, maybe your father was a theologian. I would suggest, and I think it's going to be important for us to really set this for the rest of our time together, that everyone is a theologian. You are the, uh, the nearest theologian to yourself that you know most personally most well. And we've really got to get our mind around that perspective uh, because we all have a thought and an understanding of God. And in fact, there are two types of theo theologians um, in the world, if we want to look at broad categories, uh, we have false theologians. A false theologian is really an unbeliever. Not everything they know or think about God is false, but the primary understanding of who God is and what he has done for us is generally uh, not truthful, not one of biblical sense, not one that would be aligned with the true understanding of God. And all the rest of us, if you would say that you're a follower of Jesus, you're a pilgrim theologian. We, we're on a pilgrimage, a journey to more completely and perfectly understand God, although we won't quite do that in this life. And so as we move forward, not only in today's class and the next two weeks, but in all of your times of study and scripture and, and, and worship and fellowship and all aspects of your faith, don't forget that you're a theologian. And that's important to have an understanding and a continued pilgrimage in the study and love and knowledge of God. So we want to start there. And like the coffee cup or the bumper sticker or the t-shirt says, because of that, theology matters. A proper and right understanding of God matters. And it matters for all of us, not just the ones that we would say are scholarly or pastorly, but that uh, we, are, we are all, importantly, theologians uh, in this world. And so with that, uh, you know, John Calvin would say about what we think of God, the idea of being a theologian, that nearly all the wisdom we can possibly possess, true and sound wisdom, consists of two parts. 
the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. Specifically, the knowledge that we are fallen and sinful um, and in need of God. And we understand that about ourselves and who God is. You know, I think it's interesting as well that uh, from the, the Middle Ages, say AD 1000, to uh, just past enlightenment, the mid 1700s, uh, the knowledge of God from a theological standpoint, uh, that was considered the queen of all sciences. The queen of all truth was theology. Most of the universities that were uh, developed and created and brought into uh, be a uh, academic institution in those Middle Ages on through our Ivy League schools that we know within the colonies that uh, were developed uh, were based on theology first. That theology was the apex of all other truth. That yes, science was important, history was important, the social sciences were important, uh, but they were all grounded in the truth of theology. If we think about the word university, uh, if we think of the Latin of that, uh, veritas, meaning truth, uni, meaning one, is that universities were formed in order to teach and, and to pass on one truth, one central truth. And again, most of those were grounded in theology. Today, we could say that most of our college campuses are, are not universities at all, uh, but they are multiversities. Uh, there are multiple truths that are uh, espoused that are uh, that are spoken as truth. And so um, many universities really shouldn't claim the title university uh, much today. So very important to get this grounding into what theology is. And then importantly is is how do we approach it? So you're a theologian. I'm a theologian. There are five ways that we approach theology Five fields within theology. And I want you to watch, it, uh, watch what, I've, what we've been doing with these fields throughout the course of our equipping classes over the past year. The first of those fields is really exegesis. It's what you and I do when we go to God's Word. It's the study of Scripture for which we are drawing out the meaning and the proper and right interpretations. We're allowing Scripture to give us direction, to give us truth, uh, to give us attributes of God. That's the opposite. The false theology would be something called eisegesis, where we're actually uh, in, in putting our views and our truths onto Scripture. But rather, exegesis is the drawing the meaning out of Scripture. So we do that when we study Scripture. We do that on Sunday morning when we sit under the teaching of Scripture. You're a theologian. You're growing in that theology uh, when you uh, when you practice an exegetical approach to Scripture. Secondly, is the study of church history. And, and no, not just for the fun or, or the facts or the, uh, you know, the, uh, the learning of it, but uh, church history demonstrates to us God's providential care for His church. It demonstrates to us the gift that is His church. It uh, demonstrates to us those, those ways and places in, in which the church has erred. Uh, perhaps through heresy or perhaps through uh, particular convictions. And how do we avoid those mistakes moving forward? And so the study of God's church through the ages is a study or a field of theology that is really important to us. Of course, then we have biblical theology. That's what this, these three weeks are going to be based on. It's going to make a lot of sense here in a moment, so stay with me. And then we have systematic theology. And I think a good way of thinking of systematic theology is it's the study of doctrine. It's when we take something like sin or humanity or uh, proper theology of God. Uh, it's, it's theologies. When we look at Christology or the study of Christ throughout Scripture. Uh, soteriology, the study of salvation throughout Scripture. Um, I talked this morning, angelology. What, what do you think that might be? Uh, when we use the whole of Scripture to study a specific doctrine and see how God speaks into that doctrine. Not, not just doing a proof texting where we take a verse and say, well, this must be what it means, the Holy Spirit. But taking all of the Scripture systematically and applying it to the Holy Spirit. Pneumatology. Not numerology, but pneumatology. The study of the Holy Spirit. And it really enables us to get a great understanding of what God has for us in that particular doctrine. Uh, you know, we talked about Romans being the most systematic uh, book in the Bible when it comes to the gospel. 
systematically takes us through justification and uh, justification through grace by faith. And, and so that's a systematic approach. So we do that often when we look at doctrine. And then finally, practical theology. That's where it's, uh, we're applying it to our life. We're looking at scripture and it's something we, we do often. We probably all desire that over these other fields as well. Where what, is, what does God's word say about how we mourn, how we grieve, how we handle conflict, how we love our neighbor, how we live out um, circumstances regarding finances, on and on and on. Uh, we use God's word to look at practical topical uh, circumstances and topics and subjects. And we are practicing the theology of practical theology. And so, you know, there's a secret in these that I shared this morning. And um, I'll go ahead and tell you as well. I told everyone in the, in the room, if you think back over to the equipping classes since last November, maybe this is your first time to view a class, you can go back in our archive on the YouTube channel or on Church Center. And you can see all the various topics we've covered over these, this past year, year and a couple of months. And you start to look at them and you start thinking, hmm, they all fit into one of these fields of theology. We looked at Romans for a month. We're going to be looking at Luke for a month coming up. That's a very exegetical theological approach that we used. We looked at church history and obviously Advent and to, to a degree, the creeds and confessions and the sacraments as church history. Systematically, we looked at evangelism and God's call throughout Scripture for us to go and tell. Practical theology, we had a month on parenting. We had a month on how to help others without hurting them, on leadership. And so the secret is that when these classes were coming together, initially we thought, well, what do we call them? Um, you know, the Sunday school model is sort of what we wanted to, to, to uh, accomplish relative to the fellowship among everyone and a place you can just come. You don't have to register. We could grow together. Uh, but we wanted to think of it as, as more intentional, more purposeful. And really, the first thought was that it would be sort of a theological TED talk each month. And um, then we started thinking, well, you know what? If we include the word theology, that's probably not going to be really appealing to, to most of us. And yet, from an equipping standpoint, Everything we do will fit into one of these theological fields, and you do them as well, and, and we need to. It's actually the, the blueprint for how we most completely, holistically take and use God's word as he had intended um, by following these five fields. So that's really kind of setting the, 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 um, uh, the framework or the, uh, the, the overall perspective of what we're now going to uh, funnel into. And that's the idea of biblical theology, that fifth field. You go back and look at the other four. But biblical theology is basically the study or the understanding of the progressive unfolding of God's one story plan of redemption. We'll call that redemptive history. We'll explain that from Genesis to Revelation through a particular lens or a particular theme. OK, think about that. I hope that makes sense. Sometimes we call those motifs. Uh, sometimes we we think about them as particular topics. But chronologically, progressively, as we move through God's plan of redemption from Genesis to Revelation, what themes or motifs or lenses do we see God unfolding that plan of redemption? And I'll give you some examples, but before I do, what do I mean by redemptive history? Well, that means that when we look at Scripture and we begin in the beginning, that we see creation. And then shortly thereafter, we see that we have fallen within that model of creation. And from then, that point forward, most of Scripture is demonstrating and telling us about God's plan for moving us out of that fallen state into a restored state. So redemptive history is really how God created us, how he, he, he designed us, how we fell from that in sin, and then how he put forward a plan uh, to redeem us, to make us whole again, to purchase us. And, and make us blameless before him so that we may be restored. Another framework for redemptive history could be that we go from the garden to our sin, to Jesus, and then to a new creation or a new garden. From garden to garden. 
And so when we think about that again under biblical theology, we can basically look at that and say that it's the unfolding of that plan of redemption from garden to garden through a particular lens or truth or theme. And as this class is, is, is uh, you know, titled, and as we've implied, that theme for the next two plus weeks is going to be the idea of um, the tabernacle. What are some other examples, though, that we might want to look at in terms of biblical theology? Well, one very popular way of looking at Scripture from Genesis to Genesis is through covenant promises. That in the garden, there was a promise to Adam, the Edemic uh, covenant, for which eat of this and this happens, eat of that and that happens. But it's a promise and a, 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 a workspace promise at that time, not a grace-based covenant, but still a covenant that was made that was broken. Then we had the Noahic covenant with Noah, never to destroy the world that way again. We have the Abrahamic covenant with Abraham that promises nation, promises land, promises a people. And then we have the Mosaic covenant around the law and to be your God and you'll be my people. Moving you forward, progressing the plan of redemption till one day all people will be my people. We have the covenant with David for which uh, uh, the line of the Messiah would then go uh, through David, through that throne. There would always be uh, one on the throne up until uh, Jesus and the Messiah. And then, of course, Jesus himself will say that when he took the, the bread and the, and the uh, cup, he says that this cup is a new covenant of my blood, a new covenant. And so we have the new covenant for which Jesus um, fulfilled all the previous covenants and, and over, over supersedes them, I guess, so to speak. So we can look at that way. We can look at the various commands of God. God is often saying, go. He's often saying, sin. He's often saying, wait, uh, be still. Um, and so as we start to look, we start to see that these commands are constant through Scripture. And we can look at Scripture that way. We can look at Scripture from the people of God, His intended desire to be with people, to then call His people, His children, to, to then uh, to move to a people in that redemptive plan that is neither Jew nor uh, Gentile, that is neither male nor female, and then an eternal people. We can see the glory of God laid out in Scripture. We can see deliverance and salvation, which is one of the motifs that really resonates with me because I see that God is a Savior, a, a Redeemer, a Deliverer. That once we fell from His relationship with Him, we start to see Him delivering His people throughout Scripture. We see him delivering, uh, well, Noah. We see a lot of salvation language in that passage. We see him delivering the Israelites from Egypt. We see him delivering his people from captivity in Babylon. We see then Jesus delivering us from captivity relative to sin. And we see Jesus himself, his name Yeshua, meaning Savior, Deliverer, and I like best of all, Rescuer is, the, is the, the meaning behind the name Yeshua. So we see that throughout Scripture. Biblical theology. I hope, I hope that that's making sense. And there is no right or perfect. It's just uh, we learn the various ways that we can see Scripture. And to me, that also provides even greater confidence to the continuity of Scripture. That it's one thing for the narrative to flow from Genesis to Revelation, to see Jesus in that, and there not to be any contradiction. But it's another thing to see that there's no contradiction, not only in the narrative, but in the themes. Thematically, all the different ways we can look at them, they stay constant. Across 40 authors, 1,500 years, three languages, multiple regions, the themes and uh, the, the theology understanding of God stays constant throughout. So it's a, it's a real wonderful way to be able to see Scripture uh, looking at it this way. And of course, we're going to be looking at the tabernacle of God. And the first thing that I think was our biggest question was, what does, <laughs> what does that mean? What does that mean, a biblical theology of tabernacle? Well, let's just, uh, let's start with the idea of tabernacle itself. The word, the word tabernacle in Hebrew is the word mishkan. Mishkan. And, and we're going to be looking at it as both a noun and a verb. Okay, so uh, from a, uh, a noun perspective, it is a dwelling place. It is the dwelling. The verb is it's to dwell or to, uh, to tabernacle. 
And that's a really important uh, idea within this biblical theology is that God has been a God who desires to dwell with his people and to dwell with creation, to be in their midst. In other words, I think uh, the real high level summary for what we're looking at is that uh, we're looking at a biblical theology of God's presence among us, how he desires it and how he made it happen rolling it out progressively, moving it forward. And it's just a fascinating, fascinating view of who God is. And again, why we, we, why we come to him in such reverence and uh, such worship and praise and glory because of this full desire for him to be present among us. So how do we do that? Well, we, when we sort of discover this general summary or thought relative to biblical theology, we, the first question we always ask is, how is God's plan moved forward in the Bible by way of his presence, his dwelling or tabernacling with us? And for us to begin thinking about how to answer that question, well, let's, let's go to the beginning. And so we go to creation and we look in the garden. And what are some of the things that we see relative to God's desire to be present with us in the garden? Well, we're told in Genesis 3, 8 that he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. There was, a, there was very much a presence uh, of his presence with Adam and Eve in the garden that he walked with them. They heard the sound of the Lord in the garden. And in fact, even after they sinned, they tried to hide themselves from the presence of the Lord. So again, a very clear teaching relative to those parts of redemptive history that are creation and fall to God desiring a presence, and then when sin occurs, the consequences of that sin are so extreme that we know to be ashamed. We know that we can't really be in God's presence anymore. And so we see this idea of God's presence in creation. Then we see it again at Mount Sinai. And over the next week, we're going we're gonna to go back to each of these, and we're going to really look at some some specifics and details to each of these and overlay them. And again, it's a really fascinating view. So I do hope that you stay with us for a couple of weeks here. But in Sinai, uh, God calls Moses up to the mountain. Some things that we know about Sinai is that uh, God's, the cloud covers the top of the mountain. There was a great holiness there. God told the people that this, this, uh, you, this place is such sacred ground that you are standing on. If you come close to the mountain, if you touch this mountain, you will surely die that there was still some separation, but God is desiring to come down to man and through his, um, his representative Moses, he is going to uh, present a way for him to then dwell in their midst as he continues to roll out this plan. Not perfect, not like the garden yet, but starting to see a way that God is going to um, come back into man's presence. And it's really, really important we get that, that this is an indication of God coming down to us. And then in no way could we have ever gone up to him. And so we see this in Sinai. We see that, that again, consequence of the separation. Uh, we see in Exodus 24, when this happened, that the glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai. It didn't just shine on it. <laughs> it, it didn't just stay distance and remote and was visible from Mount Sinai, the glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, tabernacled on Mount Sinai. Exodus 33, he's telling Moses, and this is how we know that it's not quite yet garden restored, a garden restoration presence, is because he says, I will make my goodness, my presence, pass before you. You're going to have to hide yourself, but my presence will pass right before you. I so desire to be with you. And so Mount Sinai then is, is moved from, uh, from, from there with Moses to a more uh, portable version of Mount Sinai. And that's the idea of the tabernacle. That the, the tabernacle uh, we saw in Exodus 25, 8 is that let me make them a sanctuary that I might dwell in their midst. And so what happened on top of Mount Sinai is now brought down to be a portable version to go with the people of Israel. A presence, not fully, still distorted from the original plan, but a presence of, of dwelling with the people. 
And I think we, we, we see all this in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And often we have a tendency to gloss over all of the details in these books. How was the tabernacle supposed to be made? All of the dimensions and all of the uh, beautification of it. Uh, how, what were all of the laws? What were all of the sacrifices that we see in Leviticus? Um, and, and so we have a tendency to sort of look at those and we think, A, well, they're not important for us. Uh, or B, that, uh, wow, God sure was, he sure was picky. He, he, he sure demanded a lot of them. Well, I would, I would disagree. I, I would say that what God's doing in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers is he's saying, I so badly want to be with you. I want to be in your midst. And yet because of sin, I still can't fully be in your midst. These are the ways that we can make this happen. And of course, the people were eager, eager at least initially, to make that happen. You know, one of the interesting uh, references there in Scripture I always like to look at is that if we get to the end of Exodus and the tabernacle has been constructed and it says that the Lord speaks to Moses, the Lord is inside the tabernacle, inside that tent of meeting. And if that was the same reference at that point, Moses was outside, that he was not allowed to go in to the tabernacle. And then we have go through Leviticus and we get to the first passage in Numbers. And it says that the Lord spoke to Moses inside the tent. And I always like to ask, well, what, what, what happened between the last verse in Exodus and the first verse in Numbers? How did Moses get to being uh, not allowed to go in to actually being present with God's glory inside the tent? And what happened is Leviticus happened. Leviticus allowed Moses and the priest and the Israelites to, uh, to be in God's presence. And so that's, that's what we see in Exodus, Leviticus, Leviticus, and Numbers relative to God tabernacling with them. Again, in 2945 of Exodus, we see that I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And so um, we see that God is, is taking a portable version of what happened on Mount Sinai and he's created the tabernacle. And then, 500 years plus or minus later, A.D. 957, we see the functional permanent equivalent of the tabernacle, which was the portable equivalent of Mount Sinai, is now constructed with Solomon's temple. And it's really, um, really the same. There are some differences. And next week, we're going to look at a little bit of that, of what the tabernacle and temple, what, what's going on inside there. Why does it point us toward Jesus? Why was it important in their day? What do we take from it? What's the practical application? But for the most part, we can think of the temple as being the permanent um, version of the portable version of, uh, of Mount Sinai. And we see that the Lord chose the priest to stand in God's presence. So again, a very real presence there in Second Chronicles. Uh, really great verse. Uh, again, identifying what God's desiring to do. But then we see Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And he fulfills and he supersedes again everything that the temple and the tabernacle were. Uh, because John would say that he became word, the word became flesh, and the word dwelt among us. It's also important to know that as we look at the life and ministry of Jesus and we're moved to the Passion Week, that when Jesus is walking out of the city of Jerusalem and he turns back and he looks at uh, the, the, the temple, he will say, and we see it in Mark, we see it in the other Gospels as well, that you see these great buildings because his, his disciples were admiring them, what they had become. And he says, not one stone will be left in those because they're not necessary any longer that I have now fulfilled all that was necessary to be in God's presence, that's now fulfilled in me. So the divine sanctuary of God being among his people is now in Jesus Christ himself. And so we're moving, again, redemption history forward. That availability to be in God's presence is now available to the Jews and the Gentiles, to all people. This is where we start to see God as an all people's God. It's being revealed that our great Redeemer is dwelling with us. And then Jesus would die and then he would arise and he would ascend. And yet he still left a way for us to have presence with God as the in-between time. We have the already of redemption history, 
And then we're going to have the not yet of redemption history. And in, the, in between, God has left both the church and his spirit to be, the, uh, to be the dwelling place, to be the tabernacle, the presence where God dwells with us. How do we know that? Well, you know, John 16, 7 is that great passage where Jesus says, you know, it's better. It's better that I go, you know, for if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. And we know that from the rest of Scripture to be the Holy Spirit. It is better that the Spirit dwells with you and in you than for me to remain here. It's a progression, a next step in this idea of tabernacle with you, of being in your presence. It's also why Paul is adamant, and we should be too, that the indwelling Spirit, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, this Holy Spirit dwells in us. That is so important to understand. He says, don't you understand you're God's temple? God's Spirit dwells in you. When he tells the Corinthians, uh, because of what they were doing at the, uh, at the temples and with prostitution, he said, don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? And the way that you would treat the temple of God's presence in the past ought to be the same way that you think of your own soul, that you think of yourself. And anything that, that, um, that forms or unifies with that temple and, um, and profanes it, or defiles it, should not be tolerated. It's not a matter of our physical body. You know, it's not a, a passage on we need to exercise more or eat better. Uh, the fact that we are not to defile the temple of the Holy Spirit is a defilement of our soul and our understanding of God actually being present in us. Really, really important for us to understand that. And then we finally see that final act of redemption history, and it's still a matter of God being present with us. And that's eternity. That when, God, when Jesus returns and we establish forever and ever a, a, a position around the throne, a position in, in, his, uh, in his kingdom forever, never to die, um, we see some references to this. We see in Jude 24 that it's Jesus Christ. This is his great benediction of Jude. It's Jesus Christ who can present you as blameless before the presence of his glory. Jesus Christ, knowing him, will present you as, as if you had never sinned. He will fully restore you, the final act of redemptive history. He will restore you before the glory and the presence of God. Really, really important. And then some really, really encouraging verses. Revelation 21, 3 and 22. And I do want to read these. Uh, really, really important that the dwelling place of God is with man and that, that, that I saw no temple. It's, it's great. If you look at 21, 3, it begins, it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will, he will establish the, the, the final, ultimate, um, eternal tabernacle with his people in this kingdom. And then, of course, in, in verse 22, uh, and I saw no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord God. That's incredible. That's, that is a wonderful um, just vision of everything that God had put in place in order to be with us is culminated in the idea that he has now become the ultimate final divine sanctuary for him to dwell amongst us, to be center to us, to be in our midst, in our presence. And so just, just wonderful. You know, the idea, it, it dawned on me too, is that we see this biblical theology of God's presence from the third chapter of Genesis all the way through to the next to last chapter of Revelation. That is a true biblical theology of redemptive history. And next week, we're going to be, again, looking more and more at the idea of what tabernacles and temples, why, what were they intended to do, and then we're going to merge all of these uh, divine sanctuaries on one another. But I want to leave you with this. If these were some of the more encouraging passages of Scripture, I would say that with the same idea of biblical theology of presence, tabernacle, temple, there are some tragic verses of Scripture, some really sad versions or passages and verses of Scripture. And uh, I would suggest three of them for us. The first is that when, when, uh, when man, Adam, and Eve are banished from the garden, that is a passage of being sent out of God's presence. Um, so much so that the, the angels would then guard the gate and not allow any sort of return. 
tragic passage if you think about the idea of God desiring to be present. Secondly, this is perhaps the most tragic passage in all the Old Testament, I believe. Ezekiel 10, he's given a vision, and uh, he sees the glory of God. He sees God, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, where, where God's glory existed, where his presence was made known and manifested in the, in the temple. And because the Israelites had completely disobeyed him, uh, because they were about to be taken captive to Babylon as, um, as, as God's judgment, he sees the glory of God actually rise from the ark between the cherubim out of the temple and out of the city gates. It is a picture of God's leaving his presence, leaving the presence of, of his people. Again, a very, very tragic passage. And then finally, the urgency that I think we're all to have, knowing that one day there will be many who stand before God and he says, out of my presence, I, I never knew you, depart from me. Matthew 7, 23. Again, very tragic, and it should move us to application. Wanting to share that, wanting to show that love, wanting to demonstrate who God is and our response to God. That's why we are growing theologians, so that we can better share that, so that we can more readily share that, so that we can share that with confidence, with the Spirit's strength and direction and discernment, but knowing who God is more and more each day, that much better is why we spend time in this. So next week, constructing the tabernacle. We're going to have a little bit of an activity up front, but um, hopefully that hits the highlights. That gets us started, establishes the foundation. And as you move through your week, as you move through any sort of scripture study, keep an eye on the idea of God's presence, his tabernacling with his people, dwelling with his people, how he desires it. And because of that, you know, how we should be humbled by that, how we should be grateful for that. Thanks for joining. Hope to see you week two.